We're going to be studying today, I want you to get your Bibles, and we're going to read in just a moment from John 19, kind of continuing the story that has already been read to us. Relationships are largely what life is about, whether they be between us or us and our Creator. They're very significant. I'm certainly no expert on them. But when I read Scripture, I am fascinated at the relationship that Jesus had with people. Maybe more than any other single one, the relationship that Jesus had with His mother. And this is really a a very fitting time of the year for us to, to zero in on that relationship. So many people in the religious world, uh, finding that balance is difficult. There are some who who want to make Mary into our mediatrix, sort of a, a junior God that gets us access to the Father. Mariolatry, it's a real thing in the minds of some. And as a fellowship, we tended to react so the other direction that we all but minimized one of the most significant relationships that Jesus had on this earth. As as we tend to do, we reacted to that that, that, uh, doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that has nothing to do really with Jesus' conception, but with Mary's. How can God enter the world in a a stainless form? So Mary's conception was different. I want to try to hit that balance. And I'm going to read, beginning in John 19, not so much the event around His birth, we'll get that in a moment, but toward the end. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. Though they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill Scripture. They divided my outer garment among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were His mother and His mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw His mother and the disciple whom He loved standing nearby, He said to His mother, Woman, behold your son. And He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. Let me draw attention to a couple of things here that are significant in my mind as I think about Jesus and his mother. Do you know that Jesus in Scripture never called her mother? He always called her woman. And I don't get from that any kind of lack of respect on his part, but his referencing and realizing that his relationship with humanity isn't like ours with each other. He created us. We're his by virtue of creation, if nothing else. And that made his relationship even with his mother to be different than what would be typical with us. And yet in that relationship, there is a a uniqueness, a, a bonding that we can't afford to miss. I want you to try to imagine what it would be like. Put yourself in the shoes of Mary this morning. You know when God gives a person a special assignment, 
He never promises that it will be an easy thing for them to do. Now Mary is called in Luke chapter 2 the most favored among women. And she is a very significant person. But she had about as hard of a situation as you could have. Let's, let's actually look at it. Go with me to Luke chapter 1. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, to just have your Bibles handy. We're going to be turning a lot, seeing a lot of what Scripture has to say. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was very perplexed at this statement. Kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over his, the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. What would it be like to know that God has just placed in your care his only begotten Son. That is an awesome responsibility. He lays it on, on, in the lap of this young girl. Most Bible scholars say she was at most 15 years of age. And God just laid upon her that responsibility. And you may be thinking, wow, how wonderful it would be to be this significant in the eyes of God, to be respected by the God of heaven so much that He's willing to give you this responsibility. And you just totally misread it. Because with this responsibility came some of the most <clears throat> difficult things that a person has ever faced. Just, just go with me over a, a chapter, into chapter 2. It's been six weeks since what we read earlier. Verse 23, Jesus, six weeks old, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him into his arms and blessed God. And there's a reference to what he says. And look at verse 33. His father and mother were amazed at the things said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Now, now hold on for a moment. Already Mary, as a young girl, has had to put up with the suspicions of people. You think about it. The stigma is not as great as 50 years ago when... I was a teenager. A young lady would have a child out of wedlock. And at that time, sad to say, too many times, even the child was rejected. I, I think people have matured some since then, and now at least we don't figure that the child's responsible for its parents' failures. 
Well, we kind of did back then. And there was a stigma to growing up that way. And there may still well be a stigma to that idea of having children out of wedlock. There certainly was in that society. And Mary had had to live with that. But when a baby is born, you, you want to move on. And there is an excitement. There is a thrill about it. That was refreshed for us. We had a, another grandchild a few weeks ago. It, it's a delightful time. And you go and you hold this innocent one and now at six weeks of age they take this young child and it ought to be a glorious moment and it is. Joseph and Mary stunned at the things being said about this child that God has given them to bring up, to raise. And this child is, is set for this appointed time. But don't miss verse 35. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. In the thrill of giving birth to this baby, and now, a sword's going to pierce your soul. The end of the chapter. And we've advanced 12 more years. Verse 41, His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he became twelve, they went there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning after spending the full number of days, the boy, stayed, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it. Supposed him to be among the caravan and went a day's journey and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, If you've ever lost your child in a crowded shopping mall, you know a little bit of how Joseph and Mary must have felt. It's panic time. And remember, this is no ordinary child. This is God in the flesh. Mary was told that before he was conceived. God, you take care of him until he is grown. And she's lost him. And they look for him. They return. Of course, if you've read this, you know he's in the temple. He's talking with the scholars of the law. And they finally find him in verse 48. When they did, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Now catch his response. He said to them, why is it you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? He's 12 years old, and what's he telling her? He's telling her, your home is not my home. Her 12-year-old child, but I don't belong to you and to Joseph. A sword is piercing her soul. From here, go over just a couple of chapters to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth. This is his hometown. This is where Jesus grew up. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. I'll not read it to you. He closed the book, verse 20, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they listen to him, and he makes reference to Elijah, to an event there. This is the day that this prophecy is fulfilled. Basically, they're hearing him say, I'm the one Isaiah had said would come, the great Messiah, the Deliverer. And their reaction, verse 26, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. They got up. 
drove him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Her son that he, she raised right there in their neighborhood went to school with their children, grew up with their children, played with their children. They'd been friends marrying these ladies all these years and he comes back and now this whole town is in a rage at her son. And they drive him out of the city. They would love to kill him. Her friends, her neighbors that she's got to go shopping with the next day, that's what they feel about her child. A sword is piercing her. It actually, believe it or not, gets even worse. I'm going to take you back to Mark, the third chapter, to another time, not that many months later. Mark 3, verse 20. He came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent they could not even eat a meal. And verse 21. When his own people, literally his family, this is brothers, sisters, cousins, when his own people heard of this, they went to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his mind. Did you know his own family said that about him? Mary gave birth to other children, some of them named for us. They don't even believe her when she tells them, the Spirit appeared to me. He's not like the rest of us. No, this is God in flesh. And He's out preaching and proclaiming. People are enraged at what He's saying. And now even His own family is saying, He's out of His mind. Well, if He's out of His mind, what does that mean about her? And what she's saying? A sword is piercing her soul. On the way back to John 19, you can stop at John chapter 7, verse 5. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. His brother's telling to, and verse 5 says, for at this time his own brothers did not believe in him. Put yourself in Mary's place. This, you know, you know what's happened but you see the entire world, even your friends and your neighbors, and now your own other children, they just won't buy it. They think he's crazy. And you must be too, if you really want to follow him. That was Mary's life. That was his relationship. Now, when she seeks something from him, they, too, never hear him talk to her like he's really her son. It's always woman, never mom. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus, at this gathering where they thought he was crazy, the people come up and they begin to say to, to Mary, or to Jesus. Your mother, your brothers and sisters outside, and they want to see you. I wonder if, I really wonder if Mary's able to hear this, or if word just gets back to her. But have you ever noticed the statement that Jesus makes publicly in front of a crowd of people? When they say, your mother's outside, she wants to see you. Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? Anybody that does the will of my father the same as my mother. Wow. A sword is piercing her soul. This was as hard of a job as God ever gave anybody to raise his son. 
Now let's go to John 19. This is the end. You're going to see how much love Jesus has for his mother here. I want to tell you, in, in my judgment, Mary being there at the cross was probably the greatest enticement that Jesus had to come down out of, off of that cross. And at the same time was probably the greatest reason he had in his mind not to. Because he understood his role. And it's revealed here, and I think, I think the Spirit of God must have told us this so that we would not take lightly the love, the compassion that Jesus and Mary have for each other. The cross was immensely difficult. Did Jesus want to do the things that made his own brothers think that he was crazy? No. Did he want his mother to feel rejected? Whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, the same as my mother? No. Did he want that sword to pierce her soul? Not at all. He just has to fulfill the mission that God had sent him into this world to accomplish. But on the cross, it all just sort of, in my judgment, just comes to a head... And what we're about to read is going to be the most difficult moment in his life. I'm fully convinced. Now I want you to watch it with me. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, verse 23, took his outer garment. Well, now hang on for a moment. Let me give you a little background. Every Jewish man wore five articles of clothing. He had leather sandals. They're kind of like our thongs of today. Just a little strap leather to, to, to walk. He would wear a turban on his head. Covered his head. He would wear an inner garment called a katone. K-H-I-T-O-N. A katone. I'll come back to that in a moment. Then he had an outer robe. Went from his shoulders all the way down to his ankle. And then around his waist, he had what is called in Scripture usually a girdle. It's more like just a big cloth belt. He would tie it around his waist. When he's walking, he could pick his outer robe up and tuck it in so that it doesn't get dirty along the dusty roads of Palestine. This katone, the soldiers say here, this tunic was seamless. Woven in one piece. But there's something about that garment. When a Jewish young man grew to maturity and leaves home, I think our legal age now, isn't it still 21 or have they dropped it to 18? I can't keep up. That's so many years ago. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I'm more worried about the cutoff age than I am the, the beginning one. Yeah, that's kind of a common feeling, isn't it? Uh, when he became of age, and back then it was age 30, much later than in our day and age, a mother would sew for their son a special inner garment, this katone. And uh, it, it was a gift that she would give him when he reaches this age of maturity, and now he's stepping out on his own to live in the world. It was kind of their version of cutting the apron strings. She'd give this to him as that special gift. This one is seamless. Interesting to me. The only person in the Old Testament required to wear a seamless garment was the high priest. I wonder if there's a tie. I want you to see something in this. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. It just colors Scripture better than any other translation I've ever seen. I've done something in my Bible. When you read through this, there, 
there isn't a break in most of our translations, but I think there are a couple of verses that are given to us as an explanation. So when you read in here, the soldiers took his outer garment, made four parts, a part to every soldier, also the tunic, then there is a word of explanation. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, so they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This is to fulfill Scripture. They divided my garments among them, for my lots they cast clothing. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. All of that I have bracketed because I think John pauses to give us the explanation of what's going on. Five soldiers made up the execution team. The centurion who was in charge, he just gave the orders. And then four legionnaires, four soldiers, they would escort the, the condemned man from the place of judgment out to where he was to die. And they had the most awful job of impaling a person onto a cross and staying there till he died. Now the reward they received was they could divide up whatever property he had. In Jesus' case, he's got five articles of clothing. So each of the soldiers has taken one. The centurion doesn't get any. It's not his reward. He's salaried. There's this one seamless gar garment that's left. They're saying to themselves, if we tear it up, all we have is a rag. Somebody could use it. Let's just gamble for it. See who wins. We'll draw straws, literally cast lots. We'll see who gets it. So that's what they're doing, and that's what John explains to us is happening. Drop that explanation out, and I think you see the moment that the Spirit of God wants you to see. Let me just read it. The soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, you drop that explanation out, you get the flow of this. Here are the soldiers casting lots. Each gets or, or each got a garment, then they cast lot. One of them reaches over and grabs this catone, and they, they're going to gamble for it. And the minute that soldier's hand touches that garment, what we're led to see is Jesus immediately looks from him over to his mother who's standing there. She made that for him. That was her gift to him when he leaves home. This is the emotion of the cross. At this moment, it all comes to a head. This is it. That soldier's hand on that garment. And Jesus looks at his mother. I think his mother looked right back at him when she saw that soldier grab that garment. Looked right back up at him. And his statement is, don't miss this one. To John, woman, your son, son, your mother. This is special too. In a passage that, that we got read to us just a little bit ago, there is a powerful statement that made, was made. After the upper room, when Jesus had, had had that last supper, they sang a hymn, they go out to the Mount of Olives. Along the way, Jesus said, All you will be offended because of me tonight. It's written, I'll smite the shepherd, the sheep of the field will be scattered abroad. Peter says, Though all these will, I won't be. Yes, Peter, tonight, for the rooster crows thrice, you'll deny me three times. No, I won't. So said all the disciples. Then in Matthew 26 and verse 56, the simple statement is made, they all forsook him and fled. That doesn't say they all except John forsook him. 
John did too. And I don't know his moment of repentance. That's not recorded for us. But in the few hours since all of that happened, John came back and he's there. And here's what I don't want you to miss. I don't know what your failing is. I know mine. I'm sick about them to this very day. But I've learned something. It doesn't matter what you've done. You come back to the cross. Jesus has a place for you and a very significant responsibility to a man who just a few hours before forsook him at his great hour of need. He now says, take care of my mother. If he can do that for John, he can do it for me. He can do it for you. That's what this scene at the cross is to bring us to. What's your failing? I don't need to know. Just know that not only does he forgive, he has something very important for you. We have an invitation song, don't we? If you have a need, there'll be some people in the back or we can help you down front. Let's stand and sing that song.